Long before European explorers came to the New World, and long before the first white man visited the Kanawha River Valley. In fact, for over 12,000 years, different Native American peoples hunted or lived throughout the area. This was a land rich with vegetation, and animals and humans thrived here. The Kanawha River Valley was part of a great passageway linking the east and southeast with the west. The Kanawha Valley was always a major trade route from the Midwest to the southeast and east coast. You can tell this by the um, different types of shell that came out of the Gulf Coast and East Coast that is found on, um, well, in mound burials first and then later in Fort Ancient Village sites. Along some sections of the Great Kanawha, salt was abundant. Salt, like water, is essential to human and animal life. The Kanawha salt area was this extremely important to the Shawnee people and Indian people because the process of boiling down salt, it takes about 40 gallons of water to be boiled down to make a bushel of salt. And in the Kanawha area, it only takes 15 gallon of water, so it was much more productive much less labor intensive and it was a good quality salt. And so that made it a very favored spot for the tribal people. This was an Eden, honored and valued by those who came for sustenance. At the center lay the Great Canal, a river less than a hundred miles long, a river that remained unchanged for the longest time. West Virginia's Great Canal River is formed where the Gauley and New Rivers meet at Gauley Bridge. It meanders in a northwest direction until it flows into the Ohio River at Point Pleasant. The Elk River empties into it at Charleston and the Big Coal River at St. Albans. Some claim that the Kanaw is really an extension of the New River, which flows north from its beginnings in Ash County, North Carolina. New is a curious name since it is considered one of the oldest rivers in the world. In much earlier times, it was the Tays River which flowed here and emptied into the Mississippi. Glaciers from the last ice age blocked the path of the Tays, resulting in the formation of the Kanawha and Ohio Rivers. About 12,500 years ago, the first Indians hunted large animals like woolly mammoths in the Kanawha Valley, where the climate was cold like Alaska's. As glaciers melted, temperatures grew warmer similar to today. Native people hunted bear, deer, and small game like rabbits and turkey. They gathered nuts, berries, and wild plants. About 2,500 years ago, they started growing much of their food using seeds of wild plants. This Sodina culture also buried their dead in mounds, some of which are evident today. Later, on small farms, Indians cultivated corn, which became a main part of their diet. About 900 years ago, they began building large circular villages along the Kanawha River and growing crops of corn, beans, and squash. 
300 years ago, Iroquois Indians from the north attacked these villages and drove the residents away. By the time the first white settlers came to the Kanawha Valley, all of the Indian villages had been deserted. Although the area was still an important hunting ground of several tribes, including the Iroquois, Shawnee, Cherokee, and Delaware. Well, we know from documents during Dunmore's War in 1774 that there were large fish, there were large catfish, there were muskies. We know from archaeological records that the fish species diversity was quite extensive uh, based upon the middens that American Indians of that era left. We also know that the mussel diversity, freshwater mussel diversity, was extremely high based upon the findings in archaeological middens. When the white men began exploring across the mountains into this area um, in the early 1700s, it became uh, a, a place, it became a place where they found minerals and so forth that they wanted and um, it also very quickly became the focus of land speculation. We look at America at that point, you realize it was virtually virgin land. Uh, the Native Americans had used it, been a part of it, hunted there, but Europeans found this to be unbelievable. Some of the earliest white men that came, that came into the Kanawha River Valley came as early traders uh, with the Indians because there was always a, a profit to be made by getting hides and, and so forth, but um, almost as early as that, the Ohio Company was speculating on land out in the Kanawha Valley. George Washington was uh, a businessman as well as a great patriot. He and his brother and several other people traveled to Pittsburgh, uh, bought boats, and traveled down the Ohio to the point that was Point Pleasant. Many of the natives in Point Pleasant, West Virginia will tell you uh, their town was named by George Washington, calling it a Pleasant Point. He only went about 14 miles upstream to check out the lands, and he was, uh, he was really, really uh, intrigued by and spoke of the game that was there, the great amount of it. He later would hire land agents who would acquire over 300 and some thousand acres of the Kanawha Valley, including the salt works above the area of present-day Charleston. Washington was not um, uh, totally financially disinterested in any endeavor he engaged in. And where there was an opportunity to make money, you could be sure that George Washington would be in on the ground floor. Something that people don't realize is the last agreed treaty boundary was the Blue Ridge Mountains that Thomas Jefferson could see outside his window at Monticello. So these people who came into the Kanawha Valley were hundreds and hundreds of miles beyond territorial boundaries. So it was not uh, an easy road for them to trespass. There was great conflict about who owned America or what part of America. The French proclaimed that they owned a great deal of it. The English proclaimed they did. The Spanish proclaimed they did. More interesting than that were those people who were migrating to America had little or no interest in who owned it. They were there to travel to it and have a new home, go to the promised land, be where they wanted to be. And most of them followed the routes of the rivers, whether it be going to Pittsburgh down the Ohio or crossing the Appalachian chain and getting on to the Canal River Valley. After the, the white aliens came in, it became a place of commerce because you had the Canal River and other rivers that were meeting that Ohio. So it was a perfect place for trading. Therefore, you would get those early traders who came in. The traders came first, and then the settlers would come after. As more and more Europeans came to the North American continent, more and more of them moved west. Keep in mind, they were moving into lands that they considered the Native Americans to be hostile. They would move in and live together in, in communities, many of them building forts to protect their areas. Our communities were being invaded, and our people were being killed people would come settle quickly and then they would explore beyond that point. Our entire community suffered, truly suffered, and so we needed to replace those people. So we would try to force those illegal squatters out of the communities, burn their villages, try to encourage them to go back. 
And some of our warriors would actually try to match physically the way a family member looked and the age of that family member when they would take captives because that's exactly what they were going to be. They were going to replace someone else's life. For decades, violence punctuated the tranquility of the Western frontier, ultimately ending by treaty and by force. Forts gave way to towns and villages. For example, where the Elk meets the Kanawha, Fort Lee became Charleston. At the junction of the Coal and Kanawha, Tackett's Fort became a village called Philippi, which is known today as St. Albans. Point Pleasant and Gawley Bridge both prospered. When Charleston was incorporated in 1794, 35 families lived there, and the legendary Daniel Boone was one of its residents. An area just a few miles east of Charleston held major significance. Kanawha Salines, the present-day town of Malden, was a plentiful source of salt, a commodity in great demand by increasing numbers of settlers. Back then, salt was so important because it was used as a seasoning of food, but also as a preserver of food, which was even more important at that period because there was no refrigeration and salt was used to cure all types of meats and other food. Early entrepreneurs perfected methods to pump salt brine from shallow wells and used wood and later coal fires to boil the brine dry. Salt was uh, readily available near the surface but there were increasing uh, uh, interest in, in digging for it. And um, the equipment, the jars and various other bits and pieces that go along with drilling uh, formed the basis of the oil industry, which in West Virginia took place uh, on the Little Kanawha uh, east of Parkersburg. Uh, so we can look back uh, to the great uh, international oil industry and, find out the drilling techniques were really perfected here. The uh, salt producers here, uh, like the Ruffners and uh, Dickinsons and others, were always looking for markets in the east and the west. And they could uh, float salt barrels uh, on the Kanawha and down the Ohio. The real problem right from the beginning was getting bulky um, cargoes east over the mountains and this led at uh, the very early time uh, during Washington's period of uh, trying to uh, wrestle um, a transport, transport system over the mountains and this led to the initiative to move from Richmond, Virginia up over the mountains with the canal, uh, the James River and Kanawha Canal. It was a bold undertaking. President George Washington strongly supported its creation, and none other than the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Marshall, headed a survey party to find the best route through the mountains. The Virginia legislature asked him if he would write a report uh, detailing the advantages of linking uh, the James with the Ohio. And I don't believe anyone in the Virginia legislature assumed that in the process of writing that report that Marshall himself, who had been Chief Justice since 1801, uh, would personally lead a survey party from the headwaters of the James uh, over the Appalachians uh, uh, to the Ohio. Marshall did that, I think, for a number of reasons. First, he was... Um, a strong opponent of the War of 1812, and this was an opportunity to get away from that. He also was interested in doing it. He, uh, as a young man, had worked uh, as a survey assistant for his father, so he was generally familiar, and I think just uh, genuinely interested in doing it. Marshall was an outdoors type of person. Over decades, a large portion of the canal was built on the eastern side of the mountains and the canal was improved through dredging and the building of small wing dams. There was a scheme which I find very interesting and that is called the Central Water Line. And that would run from Richmond, Virginia uh, to the foothills of the Rockies. And uh, the promoters got the governors of all of the contiguous states 
uh, to sign on to this. Um, there were estimates and the big um, block was to try to get over the mountains with a canal. It was later uh, changed into the Kanawha Turnpike uh, for just that purpose. The development of the steam locomotive proved the downfall of the project. Settlement and industrialization increased along the Great Kanawha. The eastern section of the river witnessed the development of salt production, coal mining, and small-scale chemical manufacturing from salt. And we begin to see communities beginning to develop around those discoveries and those opportunities for jobs and occupation and economic development. Along the western section, agriculture flourished. These were agricultural plantations, and agriculture remained the, one of the major uh, industries of the Kanawha Valley well up into the mid-1800s. The Kanawha River was the prime transportation resource for commercializing these industrial and agricultural goods.